Hi, everyone. I'm Commerce Next co-founder Veronica Sanseb. Scott and I are taking turns introducing the sessions, and I am thrilled to introduce this next presentation, Are Your Best Customers Bought or Made? Joining us will be Andreas Reifen, founder and CEO of Creolytics, and Terry Westlake, customer director at Dunelm. Andreas and I did a conversations with Commerce Next video just recently, and I can say that he makes a compelling case. I'm really excited to have him join us on stage. Andreas? Hi, Veronica. Thanks for the Hi. introduction. Just go right into it. Um, you said the title is, Are Your Best Customers Bought or Made? Let's clarify this title a little bit. Where am I coming from? So basically, the question is, do we um, acquire customers who are equally good and then we give them some treatment we might show them ads and this way we make them better customers more loyal customers or is it the opposite that um, we acquire people who are predisposed to be rather loyal or not so loyal and it doesn't matter that much um, to what extent we are showing these guys ads so let's jump into the agenda we'd first like to took take a look at the data to see, to find some evidence and answer that question. A second thing is then, um, let's take a look at how we can actually acquire good customers upfront through performance advertising. And last but not least, um, I'm gonna have a conversation um, with Terry Westlake on how we can improve retention and increase customer lifetime value. So let's take a look at the data. Um, what we um, let me give you first some background on this. So I'm having many, many discussions um, with different people, and many of them they really claim or insist that um, um, if you get customers to make their second purchase, then you kind of are over that point, and from there on they're going to be very loyal. So basically they conclude, it doesn't matter that much when you, um, at what time you acquire customers, it's all about getting them to make that second purchase. And we wanted to find some evidence and take a look at what are people actually analyzing or what might they be analyzing? How might they look at the data? And so what we did here is we um, take a, took a look at people who bought once and then we followed all these people for 12 month time frame and we um we accumulated all their margins they made in this 12 month time span and then we took a, a different data set all people who had just made their second purchase and from there on we also follow them for another 12 month and we do the same thing we aggregate all the margins they generate over time and this analysis gets us to this really impressive figure where the customer lifetime value of the ones who have bought twice, so the ones who have made just their second purchase is 315% higher. So the conclusion many people draw is, okay, if these guys who have bought a second time are so valuable, let's just throw ads at them. And um, we'd like to now find out, is this actually true or is it rather a myth and a misconception? So um, what we did is we took a look at um, the data from a very different angle. And what we um, actually did is we let a customer lifetime value prediction run. And what you see in this chart is a bucket which shows the likelihood of a second purchase coming out of these uh, models. So we see many people are just there in the middle with 30% likelihood to repurchase. And then based on these models, there are um, people who are, have a very, very high likelihood here on the right to come back and repurchase. The darker um, um, segment of these bars is when we actually take a look who came back in reality. So we um, look backwards and we track these people who actually came back and made a, a purchase. So what we see here in the first place is apparently according to these models, not everyone has the same likelihood to repurchase. So people we acquire today seem to be completely different by nature. And um, the more interesting thing we are seeing here is that as um, you see the dark segment of the um, um, bars on the right almost filled out, which proves that where we predicted that people would come back, they actually did come back. 
and rather on the left hand side you see just this light blue in the bar means where we predicted that people are unlikely to come back very very few of them actually came back so this clearly indicates that it's not true that we fire ads um, at people and then we make them good customers. It's rather the opposite. We acquire people who are inclined to repurchase or other people who are just not inclined to repurchase. This could be gift givers who just buy um, a gift for someone else. It could be someone um, coming from Europe, um, spending a, a week in the United States and buying something. These people will just not come back no matter what we do on the advertising side. So just very briefly, um, um, how do these um, CV predictions, um, prediction models actually work? So there are two components. There's a CLV clustering, which uses a classification algorithm using gradient boosting position trees. And we have the probability of a subsequent purchase, which is using a logistic regression, also using the gradient boosting um, decision trees. Then um, just briefly what features go into it. Um, we see that um, a very strong influence has the product category purchase. So if I buy a certain product, might be a store brand from a specific store, I'm um, very likely to go back and purchase again and again from that company. Order date makes a huge difference. If I buy on a Black Friday, um, it's not the same as um, if I buy whatever in-season products in February or something. Um, the data we need here is mostly transactional data like order margins, um, including returns. Um, we need a new customer flag. We need the basket composition, but we can also use demographics um, like gender, age, and if available, as many other data points as we can. And all this we put back into the models. And this way we get to an accuracy of um, somewhere between 68 um, and 79%. Um, based on um, just a single first purchase, which makes a huge difference. So if you have a long journey already, um, you know that um, you can be way more precise, but for reasons I'm gonna mention um, further down this presentation, it's really important that we actually um, score customers right when they make their first purchase. So um, the question is now, as we learned, it's not about throwing ads at people, but rather identifying the right people up front. The question is, how can we actually do this through performance advertising? Because the claim is definitely not advertising doesn't work. It's just a matter of how you use it and what you do with it. So um, the first um, approach is um, we call data activation. And I'd like to walk you through um, the whole process um, and highlight how this actually works. So it all starts from a customer journey. People click on different um, ads and um, towards the end, they complete a purchase. When this purchase happens, what we need to be able to do is assess the value of each click within the journey. And um, what we do first is we assess the order margin. So we'd like um, to know not only what was the revenue, but also what was the margin. So we take out costs of goods sold, we take out um, order related costs like shipping, packaging, processing, and so forth, and so on and so forth. The second step is then once we have that first order, we predict what this very specific customer is likely to do or is supposed to do um, over the lifetime. Lifetime can be 12 months, 36 months. We never take the whole lifetime. And last but not least, the question is, would this transaction eventually have happened without that click? So incrementality slash attribution plays a role. And this way, we derive this value per click, which we then put back into um, the Google bidding system or any sort of um, biddable media system. Um, on the Google side, data activation is, is the most effective. That's why I'm using this um, example here. So once we have the right data on a per click level and we can predict future purchases, we can do a little bit more than just assessing performance um, based on first purchase revenue. We can look at how much did we sell in terms of margin after returns to existing customers? How much did we sell to new customers? So people we, we newly acquired within a certain time frame, but also 
um, what did these people actually do in terms of repeat um, purchases within the time frame? And then we can predict outside the time frame what else do we expect from these guys? So it means that we can qualify or we can assess the real ROI, including all these repeat purchases over time, which gives us a whole new world to optimize our campaigns because we can then more effectively um, put our budgets against segments where we acquire the most loyal new customers. And um, as a last step, we can see how, how did the prediction models actually um, work? Was there, um, was there a gap between what we actually saw retrospectively? Um, do we need to close that gap? We can change the time horizon. If we wanna invest more aggressively, we take a longer time horizon and we can set the targets here. So basically what this um, does here is instead of optimizing keywords and ads and landing pages, we really focus on the measurement here and um, we make sure that we invest in the right way while um, AI coming from Google, Facebook and the likes is doing the job under the hood. But we inform these systems so that um, these systems can actually make um, better decisions. And a second way um, to acquire um, loyal new customers is um, using so-called value-based lookalikes. So um, how does this work? It's actually pretty straightforward. We have our top CLV customers, which we um, segment out. Then we can build lookalike audience lists, and um, then we can target these high-value new customers. This is a mechanism which um, we can also apply in um, paid search. Um, however, on the Google Shopping side, there are just some limitations because audience exclusion is not possible. So we will always acquire a mix of some similar good new customers, but um, there's no way to exclude the existing customers, something which is possible, feasible on the text ad side. And yeah, so this is um, essentially, these are the two mechanisms um, we have in order to not just drive top line revenue, but rather make sure that um, we drive, we sell high margin products, ideally at low return rates, and we tend to sell them to the most, most loyal new customers, which um, makes a huge, huge difference if you analyze the long-term return and the real true bottom line impact. So as we said initially, um, advertising, is probably not the most effective way um, to drive customer lifetime value to improve retention. And um, I even feel there's a misconception because we see phenomenal KPIs when we sell to existing customers, but there's also usually a much lower incremental impact. So um, it really, um, it's important that we understand that we might have more effective levers to actually um, improve um, retention and increase customer lifetime value. And if we do so, we have way more leeway on the performance advertising side. So it's probably better to focus on um, how we can actually fundamentally improve the ability of a business to, um, to retain customers than just fire ads at people. And um, I'd like to introduce um, Terry Westlake. Can I have a quick Q&A with her? Um, why did I choose Terry? Because she had lots of um, customer-centric roles in the past. Um, she's currently customer director at Dunelm. Before, she was um, chief customer officer at Reese, um, spent quite a while at Urban Outfitters and also ASOS. And Terry um, has done this many, many times. So let's welcome um, Terry and um, ask her um, a few questions on um, what we can actually do to improve retention. Can Hi, you hear Andrea, it's good to be here. Perfect. So, um, Terry, um, what would you say, how does advertising relate to CLV in your opinion? Do you feel it's um, an effective way to improve retention and, um, and get a higher customer lifetime value out of this or what's your, what's your stance? I think it plays a part, um, but I don't think it's all a story. And I think that sort of is quite clear. Really, 
um, advertising is about acquiring what hopefully are going to be what I would call target customers. So customers who you think will be, um, to the conversation you just had really, will be your loyal customers. Um, and that's both in performance marketing, where you can do it in very behavioral ways, but also um, in brand marketing, where actually what you're trying to do is, is actually put the marketing in front of and make it appeal to the people who are most likely to be your loyal customers. That's not that we reject anybody else. And clearly there are some people who are, who are not going to be loyal, but still might want your products. And you want to be fast and efficient and convenient for those folks. But what you want to really do is understand who are your most loyal customers currently? What are their shared attributes? And how can you find more folks like those? Um, I'm wondering, Terry, if you, um, if you take a look at, um, um, at the market, there are some um, retailers who have very, very loyal um, customers coming back again and again and continue to buy from a certain business. And then there are other businesses um, which um, might just sell once to someone and people never come back. And I can even um, relate this to my own experience. In the very early days, we um, acted as affiliates in paid search. So we had one client, Zappos, in these early days, and then we had shoes.com. So what we saw is like, um, how long does it take until all the sales come in? And for Zappos, um, in a um, 60 days time frame, people who had clicked initially still um, kept purchasing. And some of them purchased many times. And shoes.com, you sold once, and um, the next day it was kind of over. Where do, do these um, differences actually? come from in your opinion? I think um, what's really important is once you've found a customer who is likely to be a good customer for you um, and that means that you have to know who your best customers are um, it's then the rest of their experience that's really critical and this is where honing the whole of your proposition against your target customer and I think in most companies that I've worked in and you know, 10% of your customers will be generating somewhere between 40 and 60% of your sales. So actually changing your proposition to best meet their needs is the thing that's most likely to create frequency. And by that, I mean, obviously, you've got to have the right products um, and not just the product that um, maybe adjacent products, maybe things that they might buy with that product. So make sure you've got the range. And if you're a specialist, uh, I've worked mostly in specialists, the specialist range that appeals to them. Then you've got to make sure that your your um, delivery experience, one, does what it says, but also is meets their needs. So I think if you're working in fashion and for teenagers, it's got to be next day. If you're working in a different market where that immediacy isn't required, it might be a little bit later, but actually it's got to meet the needs. So it's got to be convenient for the, for the customer. But then it's the whole experience. So it's the, the tone of the emails. It's the quality of the content. It's the... Um, it's the experience you get when you ring up customer service. And that has to both be really tailored to the audience. So if you're a 20-year-old 20 20 into fashion, you've got to feel like it's for you. So the, you know, the models have got to be cool. The copy has to be using relevant language. It's got to feel like your home. Um, and so all of that experience actually leaves like an indelible mark on the customer. They feel something about you. So you're more important than just a transactional experience. And that's creating a really um, customer focused process through the whole of your experience, which is all about engagement and then providing them the opportunity um, to actually contribute to that. So feedback, anything that they do, any feedback they leave, um, any, the more that they interact with you, the more loyal they're going to be. Um, so find the right customers, treat them brilliantly, give them everything both emotionally and practically that they need to that experience. So you you, you mentioned process, um, and um, apparently that's um, that's not a miracle or science. It's something you can actually repeat and do um, for many different businesses in a similar way. Can you just briefly outline what these um, process steps look like? Sure. You start with... Um, Having a, having a purpose, so what are you trying to achieve for your business? Um, and that's something like defining your audience. So I've had helping 20-somethings to look, feel, and be their best, you know, um, developing professional, um, helping professionals to look their most stylish. You know, you create what is it you're trying to achieve. You know who your target audience is, both behaviorally, um, but also emotionally, so their practical and emotional needs. 
And then you de define your range, your proposition, your communication strategy against that target audience. And then you check it, you, you, you put it in action, you see what works, you look at incrementality, you look at the, your, your customer stats. So understanding your customer life cycle, understanding that each cohort that you're bringing in is becoming more valuable. And if they're not, making sure that you're talking to them on a really regular basis to understand what's working and what not working in your proposition. And it, and it just, it's a flywheel. The more you do it, the more you need to do and the better you get at it. And that then enables you to acquire customers who look like those customers or are predisposed to be the customers that you've got that are already really successful with you. So if you apply um, Terry's recipe plus the right advertising, this is probably what's going to make you successful. Terry, thanks a lot for sharing your um, knowledge and insights. Um, and also thanks to the audience. I hope you enjoyed it.